with increasing deep clip bounds. Please, with the lead. Um, thank you very much also for the invitation. Um, this is the second time this year where I'm invited to speak in Poland, but can't uh, be there in person. I, I hope it will be the last time. Uh, not the last time I'm invited, but the last time I'm not there. Um, when I talked earlier this year in the seminar in Warsaw, I thought it was nice to mention that uh, some of the work we've been doing actually um, raises question in questions in transcendental dynamics, but I, I mentioned it very quickly. And in hindsight, I thought I didn't spend enough time on it. So my plan today is to talk only about this part of, of the project. Um, and uh, the, uh, this part is joint work with Piotr Buys and Ferenc Benz, where Piotr is a PhD student and Ferenc is a postdoc both in, uh, in Amsterdam. And you can actually see them uh, by the camera of David de Boer, who is uh, in, the, in the seminar room in, in Amsterdam. Um, so we're going to look at the independence polynomials, something coming from, from graph theory or also from statistical physics. Um, and we're going to increase the degree uh, of the graphs we allow. So the degree of a graph is the, is the maximal number of points of, of edges that comes together in a, in a vertex. And for each degree, we get some uh, rational dynamics. The degree of the rational map is related to the degree of the graph. And as the degree increases, we obtain in the limit a transcendental function or a, a semi group of, of transcendental functions. And um, this, is, this is the idea of what I'm going to talk about. This is an example here. In the background, I've drawn something that resembles uh, the attracting basin of a, of a, of a function, um, let's see, of a function lambda e to the power minus z for, well, I've, I've uh, given the lambda there. It's a, it's a parameter value lambda for which we have an attracting fixed point. So in, in shades of gray, I've drawn the basin of attraction and in white is, well, a hint of where the Julia set is. Um, <clears throat> and in blue, the, the blue set is what I'm interested in. It's called uh, V lambda. And V lambda is defined as follows. I start with zero. And I, I, so here's zero, and then I get uh, my point lambda, and then I take the convex hull. So I obtain, oh, I obtain uh, this uh, arc, or this, this uh, interval, and then I map it forward again with my map. So maybe I obtain something like this, and then I take the convex hull again. So I obtain an uh, set with interior like that, and then I make it map it forward again, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and in blue you can see uh, different generations of these sets. And uh, what I'll later discuss is that um, either either v lambda, which is the, the union of these sets, so increasing union of these sets, either this is bounded, in effect quite small. Or, um, or it's everything. At least this is true for, for a non-real lambda. If, if, it's, uh, if you have a real lambda, then it's either a bounded or the uh, real axis. Um, in, so in most of my talk, I will discuss why I'm interested in these sets, because I'm actually doing applied complex dynamics. Um, I'm a, a, applying ideas from complex dynamics to graph theory um, and, and computational complexity problems and uh, statistical physics. So, so I'll try to explain where this comes from and, and then I'll discuss some uh, properties of these sets, V lambda and, and what you can deduce from that. So, oh, uh, let's see. 
Okay, this is the first time I'm using this problem, this program. Okay. Um, so the motivation comes from, part of the motivation comes from partition functions in statistical physics where perhaps you want to model a, a magnet and you think of a magnet as a, as a very large collection of sites, uh, particles that each can have a state. And, um, and uh, this, the state can be, uh, or a spin it can be an up or a down spin. If you model a gas, it could, could also be that um, a site is either there is an atom there or there's no atom there. Um, but you could also have multiple different spins. You could even have a, your spin could be a complex number. Um, I will be discussing only uh, the setting where each site can have two different spins and a gas is the best thing to think about. E each site is either occupied or it's not occupied. Um, then depending on which sites are occupied, we obtain an energy. Um, and the likelihood of a given spin configuration, so a choice of sites that are occupied, depends on, uh, on the associated energy or on the exponential of, that, of a constant times that, that energy. Um, and then to get a probability distribution, you define uh, the sum the sum of the uh, exponentials of the energies and for, let me let me uh, immediately give you the formula for the particular partition function I'm, I'm going to look at which is some lambda so this is a polynomial in lambda lambda to the power uh, the number of sites that are occupied where um, so this is, is, I have a graph G, which is I have some vertex sets and some edges. And I'm looking at subsets of the vertices that are independent. Uh, which means that uh, if you have two uh, adjacent vertices that are, they're not allowed to be both occupied. And this arises very naturally um, in some physical cases, for example, if you have a, a helium gas uh, next to a, a, a grid of graphene, so uh, there are some, some holes in the graphene where helium atoms fit in. However, two adjacent holes, they are too close to each other. The, the helium atoms are too large, so they, they can't occupy uh, nearby uh, adjacent holes. However, um, in, in all other cases, if the two holes are not adjacent, then they're so far, relatively so far away that there's almost no interaction between the helium atoms. And then the, the energy of a, of a choice of an independent set only depends on how many holes are filled. So you look at all possible fillings of holes of independent sets and your probability distribution has, has um, well, you have to divide by, by this sum to get a probability distribution. And in fact, this is called the partition function and it, it describes all physical properties of the, of the system. This thing and uh, its derivatives. Um, so uh, here's a theorem of Li and Yang from a long time ago, 1952 which says that um, <clears throat> uh, away from zeros, there are no phase transitions. Okay, that's a a very physical formulation of the theorem, which is actually a math theorem. So phase transitions, that means uh, non-analyticity
uh, in, in R. So you look at physical parameters. Um, of what? Uh, these are polynomials. Of course, they're analytic. Well, you take an increasing sequence of polynomials, and then you consider uh, the pressure function, log z, g, n, and then maybe divided by uh, the number of particles. And they prove that this, if you, if you consider larger and larger subsets of R, Rn, then this, uh, or of z, if you, if you want to formulate it in terms of graphs of, of z this, of, of, of zd, so of, of uh, this is square lattice or cubic lattice, then this converges to some, some limit pressure function. And if, so away from the zeros, if, if this partition function is not zero, then you get a sequence of uh, analytic functions that converges to an analytic limits. So these zeros, they are in C, they're never on the positive real line. This, this function is, is never zero on the positive real line. Um, we're, we're, we have only positive coefficients. However, in the complex plane, these zeros can accumulate on the positive real axis. And when, you, when that happens, the limit function may not be analytic on the, on the positive real line. So if you, that doesn't occur, then, um, then you have a nice analytic function. Um, there is another theorem that also shows the importance of, of the zeros, which is a much more recent theorem due to Patel and Rechts. Uh, this is 2017. Um, paraphrase, this theorem says that if you have no zeros, then you have an efficient algorithm. Let me be more precise. If you look at the largest uh, connected component containing the origin on which you have no zeros for any graph in your class of graphs that you're considering, then on this connected component, you have an algorithm that computes in polynomial time, well, doesn't compute, it approximates your partition functions up to a multiplic small multiplicative error. So uh, it's, it's in general not it, it's a hard problem in, in terms of, it's a computationally hard problem to, um, to exactly compute the partition functions. But uh, in terms of this pressure function, where you take the logarithm, having a, a very small multi multiplicative error is okay. Um, so in this domain where you don't have zeros, you know you can do this in polynomial time, which is, which is about as good as you can hope for. So there are two very different motivations for studying the zeros. Now, so Patel and Rechts, they are both, they are combinatorists from the University of Amsterdam and they uh, drew me into this, this research area because it turns out that um, for many graphs, you can describe uh, these, these uh, partition functions and also the zeros in terms of dynamical systems. And in fact, many of those ideas are still valid um, in settings where there's no clear dynamical structure. So um, let me introduce that idea. Um, so the, the, um, if, you, if you have a graph that is in some sense um, recursively defined. So for example, if you have a, a tree, which where um, if you take uh, the, the top vertex and you take its, the subtrees that you get when you remove this top vertex, you get similar trees, but of a one, one uh, lesser height. You can try to express the partition function of the whole tree in terms of the partition function of a subtree. And if you can do that, then you get an iterative procedure for describing um, describing the, the partition function. You can have similar 
recursive graphs, for example, um, Blecher and Roder and Lubitsch already um, more than 10 years ago studied things like a, you know, a diamond hierarchical lattice where in each step you replace each edge with a diamond. So again, uh, you get a, 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 a recursive family of graphs um, and where in the, in the tree setting, you obtain one dimensional rational functions here, you obtain a two dimensional rational function. So there, depending on which graphs you consider, um, you, can, uh, you can get different dynamical systems. Um, however, those dynamical systems, usually you don't describe the partition function directly, but you describe something that you can could see as a, as, a, as a coordinate change or um, you describe the occupation ratio. Which says, well, what's the, what's the chance that a given vertex is in, is, is occupied? Um, so the, the chance would be, you look at all possible spin configurations where that, that one is occupied, divided by all, all possible spin configurations. The ratio is, is similar. You look at Z in of divided by Z out, where Z in or Z out means you sum only over, um, over subset of the vertices where um, V is either in or, or out of your um, of your set I, so you look at only those subsets, and together together they form everything, uh, Z in plus Z out. That's just your full partition function, and this ratio uh, is called capital R, the occupation ratio. And it turns out that um, the occupation ratio behaves nicely, um, certainly when you consider trees. Um, so let me state a few theorems about this. Um, here is the first remark. The zeros of the independence polynomial, they correspond to minus ones of the occupation ratio. Well, the idea is very naive. Um, Hello, am I still here? But we lost you for a few seconds, but we can hear you now. Can you hear okay. us? You can hear me, but you cannot see me, correct? Or No, sorry. we can see you now. Oh, okay, great. So I can't see you anymore, but uh, I'll, I'll just continue. Um, hmm. So uh, the last thing I was saying is that these two polynomials, they could have common factors that cancel. Um, so it's possible that the Z is zero, but R is not minus one. However, um, the, the, the remark is true because uh, the zero, if you have an, a graph with some zero, then there is another graph for which the occupation, occupation ratio is exactly minus one. So you can manipulate, or if you look at the smallest graph for which uh, the partition function is zero, then uh, the ratio must be one. So the remark holds. Um, uh, let's see. Um, now to get uh, dynamics, we'd like to work with trees and the following theorem due to Benz, uh, who we collaborate with, 
but um, really the ideas come from earlier work of White and Scott and Sokol. Um, that the idea is that you can always work with trees. So for every rooted graph G, you can find a tree um, for which the ratios are the same. So if you want to consider uh, all graphs and you want to consider for, for which parameters can the ratio be minus one, and it's also sufficient to consider all trees. And the same, th this tree has the same degree. So if you consider graphs with a degree bounds, then it's also sufficient to consider trees with the degree bound. Um, now, where does the dynamics come in? Um, Suppose we have such a tree, so then the top vertex, we consider that the root, the top vertex has some finite number of neighbors. Let's call them U1 through UK. And the sub trees are uh, those, if we remove the top vertex, are, are, we get K uh, disjoint uh, sub trees, and we call them T1 through TK. Then the ratio of the full tree can be expressed in terms of the ratios of those smaller trees um, through this formula, lambda times the product of one over uh, uh, one plus the, the ratio of the smaller tree. So some uh, rational formula in, in more variables. However, if you have that, if you have a special tree where all these trees are the same, so if all the R, T, J, U, J are the same, then you just have a rational formula. So if, if you look at the simplest possible trees, you just get iteration of a single rational function. Um, and then you should see well, what is the value you start with. with well, um, if you have an empty graph, the value is zero. That's the correct interpretation. Uh, easier to see is that if you have a single point, then there is only uh, one possible um, subset for which this point is in, namely the subset containing that one point. And there's only one subset where it's out, namely the empty set. So you get lambda divided by one. So for a single point, the occupation ratio is lambda. So that's your starting point for this recursive, your starting value for this recursive procedure. So what we get is a semi-group. Uh, that describes all possible occupation ratios. So first, the identity is on our semi-group. And then if we have some uh, graphs G1 through GK, where K is less than the maximal degree, or the maximal down degree, the, the maximal number of uh, edges going down in my tree, then, uh, then I have lambda times this, this product, pro, uh, product that I just gave. So we have our semi-group and the occupation ratios, they are given by just my elements of my semi-group evaluated at zero. So really the occupation ratios, they are the, um, the, the, the critical orbit of my, my semi-group. Semi so that's, that's quite nice, um, but it's, it's hard to, it's much harder to, describe such a general semi-group than it is to describe iteration of a single rational function. So um, what can we say about this? So a remark again that our semi-group contains these iterates of this function, fd is lambda divided by one plus e to the power d. That's what you get when you take trees where at each step you, you, you have d uh, points going down, and um, you also contained in this semi-group the this, this semi-group generated by F1 through FD. So you have a finitely generated subgroup, but this is not everything because you can also take these combinations of different elements. So that's not in that semi-group. Um, so here's a theorem. So coming from these applications, you're you're interested in uh, the maximal zero free domain that contains zero. That's where you know your, your pressure function is analytic. So physicists would be interested in the domain, but um, 
it's it's also interesting from a computational complexity point of view because there you know you have an efficient algorithm for computing for for approximating partition functions. Um, so if you look at all graphs of well um, of of degree d plus one because d is really my down degree so the de degree of the graph is one larger then uh, this maximal zero free domain is equal to the maximal domain where this uh, family of graphs so this is uh, uh, let me see this this fd it's it's the maps lambda sorry small lambda lambda goes to uh, g lambda depends of zero sorry about those uh, lines okay so so um so the the zero free domain is the same as the normality normality re region and you can easily imagine that if you're zero free then you must also avoid some other values so by montel you're a normal family the other direction is a is a little more so um so here are some some examples Th these are uh, the bifurcation locuses that you get uh, when you consider only the iteration of that function lambda divided by one plus z to the power d uh, for d is three here above and for d is um, four on the left. Um, it was already shown that out, uh, these are basically uh, images of, of the Mandelbrot set, of course. Um, it was already shown by, uh, for people from, from Oxford, Bezakova, Galanis, Goldberg, and Stefankovic, that outside of this cardioid here, zeros are dense. And here also, zeros are dense. So uh, the, the domain UD is contained somewhere in here. So that's U4 and here we have U3. It must be inside of this main cardioid. So where um, this, uh, function as an attracting fixed point. So the, the question now is, how is is it really smaller than the the cardioid? Um, and and how are they related? Um, so let me discuss that. So what does UD look like? Um, well, here is my first uh, contribution to the uh, to the area this set ud so let me uh, draw the picture again so i have the cardioid and inside of that cardioid i have ud and here i have cd the cardioid that comes from just iterating that single rational function. And the theorem says, well, uh, UD contains uh, the real interval, the maximal real interval here. This interval is contained in UD. So UD contains an open neighborhood of that interval. And this was already conjectured by Sokol. Uh, Um, and then the question also, are they equal? Well, uh, Piotr Buys showed in his first paper that they are not. And here's a picture from his paper. If you consider um, different semi-group elements, you can see in the top right, I hope you can, you can read this. So here in the top right, you consider F2. Um, F2 after F1, and you iterate that function. In red, you see the curves where you get a neutral fixed point. And in particular here, you have at the very end of that curve, you have two parameters that stick into your cardioid where this composition 
um, has a parabolic par par fixed point. And you cannot be a normal family in a neighborhood of that point because it's a non-persistent parabolic fixed point. Therefore, you must have zeros accumulating near, well, near that whole curve. And the same for the purple curve. And Piotr uh, proved this uh, with a computer assistant proof. Really, the proof should hold for any degree, but the computer could only do it for two through nine. Um, so this still raised the question, are these sets unequal for any degree? And there is another question um, due to um, Andreas Galanis. So these rescaled cardioids, if you multiply by D, then these cardioids, they converge to a limit cardioid. Oh, by the way, I'm calling them cardioids because they come from the main cardioid of the Mandelbrot set. But in these coordinates, they're not exactly cardioids, even though they look like they, they are. So they're not exactly cardioids, but I'm, I'm so it's, it's, it's a sloppy word. But if you rescale them, so they shrink, but if you rescale them again, just linearly multiplying by D, then they converge to a limit cardioid. So here's a, a question of Andreas. Do these maximal zero free domains, if you use the same rescaling, so they're all contained, D times UD is contained in D times CD, does this converge to some set U infinity? And is this uh, set U infinity equal to, um, equal to C infinity, or, or is it smaller? Um, so this is the question uh, we answer in our in our current paper. So here are the results. Well, first the result is that these domains do converge to some limit set in the house of distance. Uh, usually in house of distance, you work with closed sets, but I wanted to formulate it in terms of open sets here. So um, if you have a compact subset in the interior and an open subset that contains the, the closure, then um, d times u do d is is um, is, is uh, must lie in between these two sets for large enough d. But and the second theorem is this: uh, this this set u infinity. It's a nice set. It starts sh shaped from zero, and its intersection the intersection of its boundary with the boundary of c infinity. Uh, is exactly to two real points, minus one over E and plus E, the two real boundary points of the cardioid. And um, so you avoid the, the rest of the, the complex boundary. Um, so U infinity is really strictly smaller than, than C infinity. And moreover, near the point plus E, which you could think of as the, as the um, physical critical parameter, Near that point, we can describe exactly what the boundary is. I haven't given you the formula, but let me now just state that it's a, a piecewise analytic boundary, but it's not smooth. It's not smooth at the point plus E. So uh, it's very hard to describe these sets UD, but in the limit, um, you can describe U infinity quite well. Um, and I'll show you some pictures. We we understand very well what U infinity looks like, and the reason we can do that is because we get a rather nice uh, transcendental semigroup, exponential semigrouping. So let me show you some pictures. What does U infinity look like? Well, here's a sketch. Um, here, this red curve here is the is the exact boundary. So we know it's near the point plus e. And in yellow and green, there are some other regions that were already proved to lie in in, um, in U infinity. In gray is the difference between uh, C infinity and U infinity. The difference between the cardioid and uh, the or the limit cardioid and this limit zero free domain. And and you can see it it it, it pinches down. The two boundaries do intersect at minus one over e and at E. Um, so here is a almost rigorous computer illustration of what the domain actually looks like. So in blue you have the nice cardioid, and then in in red is an approximation of the actual boundary, and it's 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 correct. Um, so it's close 
close to the cardioid, but it's really not equal. Um, and well, in what follows, uh, how much time do I have left, David? Can anybody hear me? You're oh, supposed yeah. to finish at 10 past or a little bit later because you started okay. a bit late. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to give you some ideas of where these theorems come from and um, and why we can get an, well, we could get a rigorous, rigorous uh, computer is illustration up, up to some very small error. Um, so why we can do this, this here and um, something that is very hard for these finite degrees. Hey, Han. Yes. Just one, one question, sorry. Yes. Uh, can you just remind us again? Uh, so, uh, what does the uh, the car the cardio at like C infinity corresponds to, and the U infinity corresponds to? So one is, I guess. The okay. Pro, so uh, the red from... one here is. Um, thank you for that question, Luca. Uh, the, the red one is here is U D U infinity, which is the limit of of U D, which is the zero free domain. Well, it's 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 rescaled, and then the blue one, I'll write it in blue, is c infinity, which is the limit of d times c d, which is the the main cardioids of of lambda uh, one over one plus z to the power d. But in fact, I'll show you a picture of this in a second. It is the main. It is the main cardioid of the function lambda e to the power minus z. So these functions, I was planning to do that right now. These these converge in in proper uh, coordinates. They converge to uh, this exponential function. Okay, uh, clear, Luca. Yes, he said yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so. So where does this exponential uh, function bit, come from? The question, uh, I got a bit confused. Uh, so where does lambda come in this picture? So you have two okay, parameters, so lambda, lambda and z. Yeah, so so uh, my semi, I, I'm, I'm taking a, a semi group of, of rational functions and I'm evaluating them at, at zero, but lambda is, is my parameter of my semi group. Oh right. So so I have, for example, okay. some some functions f lambda that I evaluate at the critical point zero, and then I look at lambda goes to this. So it's really the the bifurcation locus. Even though you can also consider these as functions in lambda, um, I I always think of them as, as lambda is in my parameter that that I uh, that I vary and, and and I look at the activity. Of the critical point, yeah, the activity locus of the critical point. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let me illustrate where the uh, where the exponential function comes from. So we had uh, this this rational function. Um, lambda. And then uh, one plus z to the power d, and now we change coordinates. So let's call capital lambda is d times lambda, and capital z is d times z. So if this is z prime, then we get uh, capital z prime is d times z prime. So this is capital lambda times one over one plus capital Z over D to the power D. And you see that as D goes to infinity, this converges to capital Lambda times E to the power minus capital Z, right? So this is, this is my function. And similarly, if I have Lambda uh, times one plus Z to the power K, where k is less or equal to d, so so I couldn't write as k as some t times d, where c is uh, between zero and one. 
then this goes to um, lambda times e to the power minus c times z. Okay, so where for finite d I have a discrete family of maps, here I have a continuous family of maps, which is easier. Um, so here is the here is the cardioid again. This is the this is exactly the limit cardioid. The limit cardioid t infinity, but it's the it's the hyperbolic component of the fam of the function lambda e to the power minus z. It's those it's those parameters where you have an attracting fixed point for this exponential function. Um, there, I, I drew some other uh, hyperbolic components, but they're ir irrelevant for us. We only care about what's happening inside this this component because outside uh, zeros are dense, and uh, and you never have uh, normality of the of the full semi group because we have many more functions than this. So uh, this is the the we have a very clear interpretation of what c infinity is. So it comes from these rational cardioids, but really in the limit, we just get the cardioid of this uh, transcendental function. Um, and um, as I just sketched, these um, rational functions converge to this exponential semi-group, F, F infinity, which contains the identity. And if you have a family, uh, uh, some functions, an arbitrary number, uh, and constants that sum up to at most one, then you can take a combination of these functions. You can sum them weighted with the SJs and then take the exponential of minus that sum. And this way you get a, a huge uh, semi group. Um, and uh, I'm really interested now in what is V lambda, is the image of zero under this semi-group. And how does this vary with lambda? Well, as I discussed in the beginning, um, this set V lambda, so this, is, this was, again, the image of Z under this infinite semi-group. It's either bounded, in fact, quite small. It's either quite small or it's everything. So we have this clear dichotomy. And then we define uh, V infinity as the parameters for which it's bounded. It's not exactly the set we want to look at. We want to look at the interior of this set. So V infinity is a closed set we can show. And U infinity, we take the interior. And V infinity is not the closure of U infinity. You also have the, the positive real line is lying in V infinity. But really, we're interested in the, in the interior. So this positive real line, well, after, after E, it's no longer contained in the, in the interior. Um, so this is why I, I prefer to work with these open sets. Um, so here are some examples of, of uh, V lambdas. And again, so what do you do? You start with, um, you start with zero. This is, I showed this also on my, on my first slide. Then you, take the function lambda e to the power minus z and you map it forward. Um, but then we can take, um, sorry, you, you can take constants here, c between zero and one. So in fact, the next time you can take the images of this full uh, interval and in fact, we could also take sums of those so we can take images of the convex hull. So, so this line is maybe mapped here. And then the next time we can take uh, the image of this, this convex hull. And this way you get something that at each stage you get a convex set and they grow and either they suddenly become very large and then in the limit become everything or they stay rather small and these are two examples of parameters for which um, they stay small. And now you also understand why I have uh, attracting basins here, because we're always in the, in the main cardioid. 
And the dynamics of my semi group is closely related to the dynamics of just the function lambda e to the power minus z. And in black here, I have the attracting fixed point of this function. And since the singular orbit must always converge there, um, we know this, this attracting fixed point is always inside. Okay. Um, okay, so I hope the picture is clear. So I'm looking at all the possible lambdas where uh, this blue set is bounded. And uh, the theorem is that these, these sets P times UD, they converge to this U infinity. So, um, so here are some ideas from the proof. Well, I have to show that if I have a, a bounded exponential singular orbit, so this, if this V lambda is bounded, then it implies that the rational critical orbit is bounded. So what's the idea here? Well, I, I, have, I have to show it in the interior. So if you're in the interior, then you have your, your V lambda here. And in fact, you can take lambda a little bit larger and maybe you get something like this. So this is V and then one plus epsilon um, lambda. It's a little bit larger set. And then, um, then I can take it a little bit smaller again. So here, this is a bit inside. So let's call this uh, K. Uh, I, I just scale with a factor so that it contains, so that V lambda is strictly contained and, and uh, this, this larger set is still larger. Then I have a, a convex set, which is mapped uh, its image under the exponential function. Here, this is exp of k. This is mapped inside of k. Oh, sorry, uh, I, I didn't draw it correctly. This is important. Oh, the the the, uh, the important point is that it's strictly inside. So it's it's uh, relatively compact inside of k, which means that if I approximate my functions, for example, by those rational functions, then if the, the approximations are good enough, then uh, our set is still mapped inside of itself. So this follow, uh, from this it follows that uh, the, the rational, so if I, if I just look at the image under the exponential function, if it's mapped inside itself, then that follows that it the same property holds for by by convexity by for all the maps in my semi group, and therefore, if I approximate these functions arbitrarily well, or then then this property is still satisfied. Okay, so this is one direction, and it shows that um, for compact sets inside of U, U infinity, uh, you still don't have zeros of the petition function. Uh, the other direction, um, so uh, sorry, uh, I still need to go to the next slide. So the other direction, if you have unboundedness, well, then, then you get everything. So how can you, um, how can you use that you get everything to get non-normality. Well, if you get everything, then you also have some um, some repelling cycle. Let's say two cycle. You can you can hit a repelling two cycle of uh, of just a function. Um, repelling two cycle of of lambda e to the power minus z. And in fact, I can, uh, by varying lambda a little bit, I can, um, and uh, by varying lambda a little bit, the cycle will also vary a little bit, and I get the neighborhood of this cycle. But then if I uh, approximate my functions with the rational functions, I still have a repelling cycle, and I can get a neighborhood, therefore I can hit it exactly, but then I cannot be a normal family because these are uh, non-persistent. No. Uh, 
Uh, you, you just can't have a normal family if you have a neighborhood of a repelling site. So unboundedness implies that you get everything, and that implies that you must also get non-normality for the rational critical orbits for large enough degrees. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, why can you? How can you describe? Uh, how can you describe the, the the boundary near the the positive real parameter? Well, if your v lambda is bounded, then every semi group element maps this bounded set into itself, and the image is strictly smaller. Therefore, inside you will have a unique attracting or a parabolic fixed point. You cannot have a, a, a rotation because you have a compact set. If, if, it's, if it's neutral, the fixed point must lie in the boundary. And you can't have a rotation. You must have positive real derivative. Therefore, you can only be, uh, if it's neutral, you can only be parabolic with multiplier one. Um, Moreover, as I mentioned, the set V infinity is closed. Therefore, uh, V infinity must avoid the non-real boundary of the cardioid because the, the boundary of the cardioid that corresponds to, um, to parameters for which the function lambda e to the power minus z has a neutral fixed point with non-real um, derivative. And that's not possible. So therefore, you must avoid the neighborhood of that, that boundary. OK. Um, now, how can you describe exactly the boundary? Well, this is a little bit of a miracle. Let me remove these, uh, this line. A little bit of a miracle. So the idea is you consider parameters for which this function composition of, oh, this should have been minus. There's a minus missing here, here and here. You consider lambda e to the power minus z composed with lambda e to the power minus a constant times z for different constants, c real between 0 and 1. And you, you look at this function and you say, for which lambda does this function have a fixed point of multiplier 1? And since it's neutral, it follows that they cannot lie in the open domain u infinity. They could at most lie on the boundary or perhaps outside. Well, if your c is close enough to 1, then they must lie on the boundary because you can just explicitly construct a forward invariant convex set. Therefore, uh, your orbits are bounded. And uh, this is really miraculous to my mind that that you can do this. Um, I, I, one of the co-authors figured this out, so I, I can say it's. Uh, um, I can admire the the idea. Um, so here's a question that is maybe inspired by my complex dynamics background. Is it true that the whole boundary of U infinity is determined by parabolic behavior or neutral behavior of some semi-group elements? So do you get bifurcations exactly when some uh, some element in your in your semi group has a neutral fixed point, or when you consider the whole semi group, then that's equivalent to having a, a neutral cycle. Um, and we think the answer is no. Unfortunately, the, we think that either this happens or may, uh, some second um, phenomenon can can occur that that causes the bifurcations. Um, and the second phenomenon has to, has to do with this, that if your set V lambda contains a neighborhood of zero, zero or of lambda, then it must be everything. Um, simple complex analytic proof, um, which I'll skip. But this is exactly what we use to draw the pictures. We, so we, we, we approximate using polygons, uh, these, these, this image, you take the exponential image, you take the convex hole, you take the exponential image, you do this a large number of times. If at some point you contain the neighborhood of the origin, ah, then you know you're unbounded. 
Um, and, and this is how we can draw from the outside the red curve. For, for parameters outside of this red curve, uh, we know that at some point you contain a neighborhood of the origin. Um, from the inside, we can also uh, approximate using, because if you get a, a convex map set, which is strictly mapped inside of itself, then, you're, then you know you're in the interior. So this way we can rigorously prove that the boundary must lie in some very thin region, which is shown here in red. Um, so let me draw, end with some conclusions. Orkan, you should finish soon. Yeah, so this is perfect because this is my last slide. So uh, we consider that this naive question, UD is CD, has now been settled. No, it's not true. It's not true for finite Ds, and it's also not true in the limit, and, and the difference does not shrink to zero. Um, describing UD precisely may be too hard, but uh, funnily enough, this, this infinite limit is much easier to describe. And I, I think you can see that in, in other settings as well. And lastly, uh, this idea turned out to be very powerful and can be applied to many other partition functions, in which case you get other transcendental semigroups, not necessarily exponential, but some other transcendental maps. And uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done here. So that let me end with that. Thank you very much. Are there any quick questions for Han? Some online, perhaps. Sorry? Are, are there any? Uh, uh, so um, you, you want to study the zero free regions for some semigroups uh, uh, of rational exponential functions, uh, and uh, you studied using uh, the set V lambda. I didn't understand uh, why convexity is important. Uh, I mean, why do you connect by straight li lines? Uh, uh, is there some uh, okay. special reason? There, there are two, two reasons. Um, so in this semi-group, I did not only uh, obtain the function lambda e to the power z. L let me uh, write it down. Um, so, so I got lambda e to the power minus z, but I also had lambda e to the power minus a constant times z, where c is uh, between 0 and 1. So anytime I have a z, I have to take the images of the whole line between 0 and 1. But even my semi-group was, was even larger than that. I could also take lambda e to the power, and then here's some sum of cj's, zj's, where the zj's uh, I already had. Um, so I really have to take the convex hole. So that's one uh, answer to your question. The other is that if I have a convex set that is mapped strictly inside of itself just by this function, then it follows immediately that it's mapped into itself by the whole semi-group. I see, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Uh, I, can I ask a question? Yes. Han, uh, it's a very nice talk. So I, I want to know about, you say about uh, um, density of uh, the zero for the semi-group. So can you tell me just a little more? Do you hear me? Yeah, uh, I believe I hear Pascal, correct? Yes, yes, it's me. Yeah, I cannot see you. Uh, and you cannot see me, but I put the camera, so I don't. Yeah, but okay. uh, halfway I lost, I lost okay. uh, my connection, with, so I cannot see you. Sorry about yeah, that. Uh, but I, okay. I recognize your voice. Okay. Um, you wanted to hear about the density. Could you repeat you, the question? Um, so for the rational map, so you take the, all the degree d. Yes. For semi group, or you fix the degree d. Yes. So you fix it, or you take all the degree d. So I fix I fix d. You fix the degree d, and, and then, then I get the semi group. And then you say the um, zero are dense. Outside no, the, the, the zero cardioid? are dense outside, outside of the cardioid. That's correct. Outside of cardioid. Yes. Okay. But okay, so the center of the hyperbolic component you see on the picture. 
Oh, I can go back to that. Uh, let me I just remove. wanted to have a reference, maybe. Oh, uh, actually, the, the statements can be found in um, my recent paper with uh, with several people that I mentioned. It's on the archive. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it relies on the on the on the paper of three other people that I mentioned, and it's not. Let's see where I had to stay. Uh, what am I looking for it's again? Before. It's before, before, before. Yeah, before. Oh, uh, <laughs> we want to go to the. Maybe it's the picture. Yeah, before. This one, right? Yes. Okay. So I, I claim that outside of the main cardioids. So this is the, the the bifurcation locus when you just consider this one iterates of this one function. Mm -hmm. If you consider this much larger semigroup, then zeros are dense. Oh, uh, zeros are dense uh, here, and it's it's um, it lies it, it was proved um, in our in our paper uh, with the Boer okay. uh, by Guerini and Recht. Okay, so the, the... But it, it relies on on. On a, a non-trivial, uh, it, it's actually non-trivial dynamics mm -hmm. by people working in in um, in a theoretical computer science. Okay. So that's very interesting. And they're called Bezakova, Galanis, uh, Goldberg, and Stefankovic. Okay. So you, you have uh, more than the center of hyperbolic yeah. components. Sorry? So I was, so I, if you look at the rational maps, so you have the center of hyperbolic components, but with the semi-groups, maybe you have much more, it's much more complicated than this parameter plane. Yes. Uh, so so on, on the picture on the right here, I, I hope you can see that in black, yeah. I sketched some zeros. It's it's much harder to to compute the zeros than it is to compute the bifurcation diagram. But these these black points are all in centers of hyperbolic components, as you say. But um, that's only when you consider the iterates. When you consider the semi group, yeah, you get every you get the okay. the mm -hmm. closure has uh, is is enormous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks Thank for you. that question. Thank you. Okay, so just we thank Hanagan. And we can continue at half past for the talk of Tony.